You're listening to Shoe In, covering the ins and outs of all things footwear, from sneakers to heels, loafers to slippers, and every type of shoe in between. Brought to you by the FDRA, the Footwear Industries Association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion. Helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. And now your footwear insiders, Matt Priest and Andy Polk. Hey folks, welcome back to the Shoe In Show. It is Shoe Radio. We're here, uh, you know, all in separate locations, dialing into one system in the age of covid um, and today's episode is really going to be focused on how our economy is doing, how our industry is doing in this larger economy, where we're headed. Uh, we hear from a lot of CEOs, C-suite folks, and, and just in general, shoe workers across the U.S. contact us constantly to figure out um, what's selling, um, what the marketplace looks like, what employment looks like, so that they can measure themselves against the industry trends. And so we wanted to do a special episode on the shoe economy, um, the economics of the footwear marketplace in order to help people better understand where we're at, where we're headed. Um, and so, Matt, when we when we look at the broader shoe economy, fortunately for us, we have a an expert on staff who is an economist who helps us sort through all that stuff. Yeah, we do, Andy. And um, he's becoming somewhat of an Internet star because of his prognostications and his various ways in which he provides analogies such as five strikes and et cetera, as it relates to the U.S. <laughs> economy and the footwear economy. And so much so, Andy, that I demanded that he upgrade his camera to a full <laughs> HD camera so that we could see the shiny gleam off his head and we could bask in the glory that is Gary Raines, FDRA's chief economist. With that, Gary, um, in, a, in an effort to cross-pollinate all, all of our various media channels, we we would be remiss if we didn't bring you back on Shoe In Show because it's been quite some time and we want to make sure that you're on Kicks Over Coffee, you're on Shoe In Show, you're on our weekly membership calls at <laughs> 2 o'clock Eastern every week. If you're not on those calls, shame on you, not you, Gary, but the broader <laughs> audience. Uh, and so what better person, Andy, to have on than Gary Raines when it comes to talking about the economy? Well, thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate it. It's uh, uh, good to be back on. Uh Talk about a shining star uh, these days. Uh, it may be more more reminiscent of uh, Lord Vader's Death Star, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> when it rains, star indeed. <laughs> when it rains, it pours. Am I right, Gary? All right. There you, so there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, so you know, over the last several months, I think we've seen numbers improve from where they bottomed out. I mean, we were looking at survey numbers from. Uh, many of our members uh, sharing their their door their door numbers almost at you know ninety nine percent down one hundred percent down because of the, all the closures and we've seen reopenings. Um, what what's the current kind of snapshot look like right now for retail sales uh, for shoe stores and then look at maybe total consumer demand um, in, in the marketplace right now. Sure, sure. It's a, really it's, it's a, a relative situation. While absolutely things have uh, have rebounded from where they were a, a few months ago, as you said, down some you know ninety five upwards of one hundred percent year year declines. Uh, while we are still down on a year over year basis, it's not nearly the the uh, plunge that we saw a few months ago. The latest numbers show that uh, shoe store uh, sales were down some about eight and a half percent year over year. Uh, still down it extends a. a a growing week, uh, a growing string of weeks of year over year declines, uh, but again, not near the the near, near triple digit declines that we'd seen just a few a few weeks ago. Now, uh, so when we look at it getting, I guess, less bad as some of the other reviews, <laughs> you know, we are now entering this this era where the stimulus has dried up. There's not really any kind of positive forecast for additional stimulus, absolutely not to the level that we saw that was seeming to prop up a lot of the purchasing power of the American consumer. Mm -hmm. And so as we head towards the end of the year, one of the charts that has captured has captured my mind and we've put out there, Gary, that's gotten a lot of attention on LinkedIn and elsewhere was the divergence of the import costs versus decline in demand. Uh, and we'll get to import costs in just a minute. But as you look at to the fourth quarter, kind of what's your gut telling you as it relates to this economy and and 
how without stimulus we're going to fare as a as a consumer base going forward. Yeah, it's a, a really sixty-four dollar question. Uh, <clears throat> we had seen in the second quarter uh, during the height of the pandemic, uh, with a very generous uh, uh, subsidies uh, rolled out at the, the state and especially at the federal level, uh, we saw that really had propped up consumer spending. Uh, that prop up consumer spending had uh, really repercussions across a, a wide range of uh, different sectors of the economy, and certainly had uh, had gone to support footwear demand. <clears throat> While we still saw these year-over-year declines in footwear demand, it was not nearly uh, the likely decline we would have seen without uh, the different um, uh, stimulus measures in place from the government. Uh, so uh, it, it does give me uh, pause that deeper into the fourth quarter, if we do not see some type of renewed stimulus uh, uh, funneled down to the consumer that uh, I, I think it would, would spell dark days deeper into the fourth, fourth quarter for uh, consumer spending, again, along a, a lot of different sectors of the economy, including something like a discretionary purchase, like a, a footwear or apparel, perhaps. Yeah, so you couple that with the the increased costs of imported footwear because of Trump tariffs mm-hmm. specifically. You know, about half of our imported footwear from China is on this list 4A, which has an additional 7.5% on top of the already paid duty. So, for example, an athletic shoe that's normally 20% duty has a 27.5% duty rate. Our import costs are up. Our demand is down. That doesn't, I'm no economist, but thank God (laughs) you're here. That doesn't sound like a recipe for success. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, you know certainly not rocket science. You know that when, when you're seeing this this uh, this issue going on, that uh, I think it does not spell a, lo- a path to long term viability for many across the industry. To where you're seeing uh, you know demand collapse so much. Of course, that's in turn weighing on retail footwear prices. And just as you said, because of the the uh, the Trump tariffs that have been in place for you know upwards of um, eleven months now, that has driven up the average uh, landed cost for footwear imported into the United States. So this kind of a combination of higher import costs but lower retail prices, uh, I think, just spells a, a, not a pretty uh, picture deeper into the uh, fourth quarter. Uh, as you talked about, looking at that that trend over the last you know 24, 25 years, those those two variables tend to move closely in step with one another. That is the average import cost and the average retail footwear price on an on an annual basis. But it is in this last year, and uh, looking at 2020, that we see this wide divergence, really by far the widest divergence between these two series uh, in 25 years. And that uh, divergence, I think, uh, spells an opportunity for a, a, a time when we've seen margin erode like never before. And I think that's exactly right. I think what we're looking at is traditionally higher costs at border. We could pass it on to the consumer inch by inch to make that up. But now we have consumers who are demanding 30%, 40% reductions before they even start shopping, not even before they start buying certain types of shoes. So all of a sudden, retailers and, and, and brands are paying much higher costs. They can't pass those costs on. So they're, they're at this point looking at just trying to get revenue in and trying to just survive through this profit. I would call it a profit crisis. Um, and I think we're, we're hitting towards the end as we get to Q4, as Gary said, we don't really see Congress agreeing to another stimulus. Unfortunately, there could be movement. You never know. Politics is the art of the possible, but right now it looks very political. It doesn't, we're, we're nearing the point where the political season after, you know, after Labor Day and leading into it, uh, leading into the election, politics takes over. People start campaigning. Legislative session goes to the side. And so uh, the divergence between the Democrats and Republicans on what a stimulus bill would look like, who would get money, where it would go, et cetera, um, is looking less and less likely. So that's a big challenge. Um, Gary, really quickly, because I think the the other point you were talking about a little bit is these imports, where they're coming from. Mainly, mainly I want to know, because when we track our import numbers, everybody in sourcing looks at it and says, okay, here, here, you know, here's where the, it's coming from. Here's the cost. I'm comparing myself to it. But these import numbers also tell us a lot about inventory levels in the U.S. What have we seen over the last six months in terms of import numbers? What are what are our inventories look like? Are they are they hugely in flux? Is it hugely volatile? Is it collapsed to match the retail collapse that we saw? Where are we at with that? Yep, great question. In fact, uh, we have seen a lot of that. Uh, that we, we've seen. 
just in 2020 that the U.S. import, U.S. footwear import numbers have absolutely fallen off a cliff. Uh, we've seen you know, substantial double-digit declines really across the board. If you look at every major category and most major suppliers of footwear to the U.S., uh, men's, women, children, athletic, uh, bootwear, leather, sandals, it really runs the gamut. And uh, shipments so far this year are lower across the board from all 10 major suppliers of footwear. Uh, to the U.S. except Cambodia and Burma. Uh, so certainly heavy hitters like China, Vietnam, Indonesia, uh, India, uh, double-digit declines uh, from all of these suppliers. And it's only uh, fringe suppliers, if you will, uh, you know, Burma and Cambodia that are seeing even even modest increases this year. So it's really a, an across-the-board issue of those uh, declines in footwear imports this year. Now, if you look at the import numbers, that's one thing, Gary, but now we are headed to what is going to be the most unprecedented holiday season of our lifetimes, hopefully behind us and forward. And we are going to have a season where there are going to be certainly restrictions in place. There will be less of an appetite for consumers to go to brick and mortar locations to purchase product in store. Mm -hmm. Uh, And there will be a highly promotional digital broadening of the holiday shopping season and as reported by Axios and Footwear News and others, that's going to see the potential for holiday shopping to pick up in the next six weeks or so, even before Halloween. So the question comes down to, have we socialized, um, have we socialized consumers enough to take advantage of this opportunity or are we going to be in an era where if we're relying more and more on e-commerce, we're just not going to be selling enough volume to pick up the pace where we're losing out on brick and mortar sales that have been lost due to the, due to the virus? Um, so I guess it's kind of a, a roundabout way of asking how you think holiday is going to fare just based on some of the data you're seeing right now. Sure. I don't think we're going to see uh, the holiday be as as drastic a decline as what we saw earlier this year. I think as we uh, approach the fourth quarter, we're going to see the declines in footwear sales continue to moderate. While I still think we're likely to see those declines persist, they're going to kind of taper, if you will. Uh, at the same time, uh, e-commerce, as you said, has really been the, the shining star this year with uh, you know so many under under um, uh, quarantine or, or stay-at-home orders, you know, or at least just afraid to venture out uh, to stores uh, like before. Uh, e-commerce has had a phenomenal year, a record-setting year, up a uh, you know substantial you know, double-digit rate this year. I think uh, e-commerce is really going to be the uh, the saving grace for the holiday season. I think uh, that a lot of shops that maybe uh, remain a little wary or hesitant to, to venture out. I think you're going to venture more online, particularly maybe older uh, older cohorts that hadn't shopped online as much, maybe not for, you know, even footwear online as much. I think you're maybe going to dip their toe in that uh, uh, for the first time and realize that, hey, you know, this is, this is a pretty good opportunity after all. So I think, yeah, uh, brick and mortar, I think we'll likely see continued double digit uh, uh, declines that will moderate as we approach the holiday season. But I think of uh, uh, e-commerce sales are really going to be the, the shining star uh, to help the holiday season as a, a fourth quarter approaches. I think I think there'll be a lot more uh, retailers who are doing the buy online pickup in stores. I think there'll be a lot more of that. So maybe not. I, I think that the challenge for brick and mortar is to, to rethink that a shopper is not going to come in for 20 to 40 minutes and have their kid try on the shoes. They're, they're willing to come in for two minutes to pick something up or drop something off that didn't fit and to entice them to come in, you know, maybe give them a discount or an extra coupon code, something like that. Um, And that's, but that's not always the case everywhere across the country, just like we've seen during the pandemic. Some places seem a lot more willing to go in places, um, Mm -hmm. Than other people, so I, I think what we're talking about is more averages. But I think I think brick and mortar will get a lot more creative, um, and and what they're trying to do to get people to come in. Um, it's going to take a lot more data in order for a lot of brick and mortars to do well coming out of this. They're really going to have to know their consumer. They need to know their shoe sizes um, to help sell them the right product. And when they come in, they know what they're going to get is not it's not going to be returned, or they don't have to go drop it back off again, et cetera. It's got to be a lot more efficient. Um, the websites for, for brick and mortar, if they're, you know, kind of a pure play brick and mortar retailer, especially independents have to be a lot better. Um, that has to be a lot t- more targeted to get through all this stuff. Um, and then maybe we get, you know, at, at this point, I'd rather pivot upwards towards more. And we've been focused a lot on the 
the shoe economy is to more of the the macro economy issues that that I see, and I want Gary to chime in as well. But I have real big concerns about the unemployment rate. I think it's a hidden unemployment rate. I think traditionally we've looked at unemployment and added underemployment, where what a person may have a part time job or something like that. But I think I think the real unemployment rate is north of twenty percent because. We haven't seen the full effect of a lot of small business owners, you know, close up shop for good and then and then apply or the gig economy. So a lot of people out there, the numbers that we get reported in from states haven't been always quite accurate. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have concerns about that. I have concerns about the stimulus running out, I have concerns about um, about housing issues where, um, um, you know, mortgage people who have mortgages. Who, uh, who have uh, you know kind of passed the law lo- the loan the loan along and and had a break in payments are now coming back up um, you know you have people who are renting um, who had uh, a moratorium on like, evictions are starting to come back it just seems like we have this you know we had this stimulus putting a lot of money in people's pockets uh, that were unemployed who did need the money and now that's running out and I feel like in 2008 what we saw was a, a credit crunch from the bank side. So from the systemic side. And now I think what we're having is a consumer credit crunch and consumer disposable income crisis on the other side where the demand is, is instead of the supply, it's the demand at this point that's going to be drying up. And I think that's something that we have to keep a close eye on over the holiday season is how much extra disposable income are people going to have to purchase presents like they did in the previous years where we were, you know, the economy was going pretty well. Um, so I, I'll just get your thoughts on that. And then um, and then I want to ask you about the Fed and their buying, their purchasing uh, and what that means long term. Um, so I, I'll just let you jump in really quickly on what, on what you think about that. <laughs> No, I, I I largely agree with you. In fact, we had uh, made the the analogy uh, uh, a few weeks ago on one of the uh, the weekly uh, uh, weekly market calls, uh, where I talked about um, uh, a, a tale of two economies or a tale of two markets, and there were several indicators showing that really that the strength and virility of the U.S. market. That gee, you know, if you look at at this measure of consumer spending, it's doing very well. Look at you know interest rates very low, mortgage rates very low, refinancings are great. You know, all these things look like uh, you know the the sun is shining and birds are chirping. Then on the other hand, uh, maybe the other side of the coin, we saw an, a number of indicators that uh, uh, pointed to you know uh, uh, distress across the U.S. economy. Uh, issues like you know the uh, uh, increasing uh, uh, mortgage foreclosures and evictions uh, before the, the moratorium that we saw we saw implemented. Uh, as I said, uh, consumer spending would have been absolutely abysmal if it was not for the, the government subsidy that was that was interjected. So really this this kind of um, uh, almost diametrically opposed uh, uh, markets is, is actually the same market uh, just uh, two different uh, two different signs you two different perspectives of it. I think later into the fourth quarter without some type of um, monetary stimulus, uh, you know, as we were talking about earlier, that I think it's going to be awfully difficult for the consumer, even with uh, those declines of consumer spending, I think it's uh, going to be difficult for the consumer even to match those low levels of spending that we saw a few months ago uh, without some some renewed stimulus uh, deeper into fourth quarter. And as I said, that could spell, could spell trouble for the, for the holiday season. Yeah. And I, I think, I think what we need to talk about too, is, as you said, there is a divergence and I think well-established, well-known brands with higher price points, are going to do less badly than wholesalers who sell it at, uh, you know, more affordable types of shoes for middle income and lower income families. Because the the it, to be quite honest, during this pandemic, the the white collar workers are quite well off. They're able to work from home. They have no issues. Blue collar workers typically have to be physically on site. Um, and a lot of those blue collar workers are the ones that are unemployed now or having these issues. And so when we look at our marketplace, we need to look at two different marketplaces within the same marketplace, as you say, and say luxury goods and luxury items are actually doing really well. Like Louis Vuitton is doing great. Um, but then you look at, you know, certain, certain retailers that are having, you know, low price point shoes for, for you know, families are three or four, or families at at uh, middle or lower incomes, they're starting mm-hmm. to pull back on their per pair purchases for their kids or for their family. And so, instead of purchasing five pairs per visit, they may be doing four or three or for themselves. Instead of purchasing that extra pair, they're not going to. 
So I think we need to see it in that way. And in, in the same way, that this is also the reason why when you look at the stock market and Main Street, why there's such a big divergence. And there's a, I think there's a hidden factor to it too, and I think it behooves us to talk about it. But the reason why the stock market is on such highs and has been is mainly simply because the Federal Reserve is buying a lot of the balance sheets up. At this point, they own one-third of all mortgage-backed securities Meaning, in essence, they own one third of all the houses in the UN, <laughs> sure. uh, if we're honest, um, in order to make sure that the 08 crash doesn't happen again like it did last time, where you yeah. had all these these issues come up on the credit crunch. But also, they're buying; they're now buying you know more bonds. They're actually buying securities, so more stocks than ever before. And my question to you is, you know, I look at this and I say, okay, like I think they need they need to do some of this to stabilize things, of course. And they're doing all they can, and, and it behooves Congress and, and the executive branch to move on the stimulus. But are we looking at something that's going to be like stagflation from the '70s in a couple of years if we don't get our get our get our our act in order and get the stuff balanced out and get it cleaned off the books sooner than rather than later? I mean, I, that's my concern is you know stagnant economy with raising inflation rates. So all of a sudden we see record low mortgage. You know, because the Fed is buying a third of all these securities, uh, and in five years, could we see it jump up seven percent or something like that? Yeah, uh, yeah, you're you're spot on with uh, uh, the, the Fed's ballooning balance sheet, uh, and that um, uh, as you said, that the Fed has really dabbled in in a number of different markets. The Fed historically has not been involved in before, like you know, mortgages, for example. Uh, and I think that is going to be uh, an awfully difficult uh, issue to unwind longer term. Uh, I think it is something that is particularly in in um, uh, retrospect, you know, what had happened with the Great Recession of you know, 2007, 2008, 2009. I think uh, the Fed uh, uh, chose to be much more aggressive this time around. But uh, the issue is, you know, now that they've really stepped in this, uh, what's the uh, prognosis for unwinding this down the road? And eventually it would have to be unwound in one form or another. Uh, that really, that again is a sixty-four dollar question that no one, I think, including the Fed, knows uh, knows what's going to happen. Uh, looking longer term, though, I, I don't think we're likely to see the the stagflation that we saw in the, the late seventies, early eighties. Uh, I think we're likely to see a, a stagnant economy persist. Absolutely, uh, th- there may be this uh, kind of momentary rebound in the third quarter. Uh, and that's on a quarter over quarter basis. Things were so bad in the second quarter, there's really nowhere to go but up. But it, I think will be a, a momentary kind of bump up, kind of that, that V-shaped uh, recovery we had talked about. But I think longer term on into uh, 2021, I think uh, we're likely to see uh, that stagnation persist uh, in the U.S. economy. Uh, but I don't think you're likely to see inflation really uh, uh, rear its uh, ugly head anytime soon. I think, if anything, that the Fed would like to see some signs of inflation. Mm. And just uh, a few weeks ago, you know, the Fed had, um, had announced and it's the uh, latest um, uh, uh, minutes that uh, they were going to begin kind of loosening their their take on on inflation. Instead of having this hard and fast 2% target, they were going to get a little more squishy with it and say, well, you know, maybe, you know, 2% in, in a little more uh, vague terms. Uh, so I think they would they would like to see some inflation. Uh, typically, that is a sign of, of um, economic growth when you tend to see inflation begin to gain some traction. And that really has not been an issue in the, in the U.S. economy for, for several years. So um, uh, in short, uh, stagnation, yes. Stagflation, no. I think uh, inflation will uh, likely to remain uh, muted for some time, uh, but I think uh, you're likely to see um, uh, you know, dull, dull growth in the U.S. economy uh, really for um, uh, you know, the foreseeable future. Now, Gary, let me ask you this. Yeah, you mentioned 21 and, and Andy mentioned you know, we're in a political year earlier in our conversation. And so if you remember, we put out a paper uh, in 2016, 17, where we were talking about how typically the economy, the U.S. economy contracts in the first year of a new administration or a new term and not necessarily an election year where candidates are talking down the economy. But now we've thrown like a ton of different variables at you in, in your new <laughs> analysis for 2021. So again, yeah. you're spitballing at this point. We haven't actually put this together for the new year, but but let's say let's say there's a Biden election or a Biden administration or, or heck even the president's reelected. What is the is the analysis around post election fatigue and economic downturn still does it still apply to twenty twenty one or is it just totally out the window based on all the things that are going on? 
Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, great question. Uh, in fact, I, I remember remember the study pretty well. Uh, we had gone back uh, decades and looked at how it, it wasn't the economy, but how uh, f- a footwear demand had uh, turned it on an annual basis in the year after an election compared to every other year. Uh, and of course, with elections every four years, it didn't matter if an incumbent was reelected or you know, a new candidate was was reelected. Uh, we tended to see uh, caution data going back to the the fifties or sixties that on the whole. Uh, Footwear consumption tended to uh, grow at a slower rate in the year after an election than in those other three years in the election cycle. Uh, so, uh, uh, not trying to uh, maybe add to the dismal view here, but if that's the case, uh, regardless of who occupies the the White House come January. Uh, this historic data shows that we're likely to see slower growth in, or at least a slower performance in uh, footwork, footwork consumption in 2021 than what we've seen in the previous three years. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be a rough ride. I mean, we're, we're seeing things get better, but I think what we're kind of talking about, if I can put words in Gary's mouth, we're, we're basically at a plateau for a period of time, I think. Um, so the, the highs that we had, you know, even last year, well, I think, Gary, we, we were topping 87 billion year over year in total consumer spending on footwear somewhere around there. Yeah, absolutely. It was right about a, an annualized $87 billion a year in, in total footwear spending by consumers. So where are we at now? Are, are we at like maybe 68 billion? Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, the latest numbers had come out. Flip back here. Uh in July, uh, we saw a, a recovery from where we were back in March and April. It was $81 billion in July uh, on an annualized basis. But if you go back to April, it was only $41 billion uh, back in April. So, yeah, uh, looking year to date, you know, we're, you know, averaging, you know, an annualized, you know, 60 odd billion dollars so far this year, a pronounced retrenchment from last year's, you know, 87 billion or so. Yeah. So I think, you know, this episode, we're, we're not trying to bring doom or gloom, but these are the facts. This, this is what our economy looks like right now. Recovery is going to be a long time in coming. And I, and I think it behooves a lot of folks out there in retail and with the brands. And I know they're reorganizing, but we work with a lot of great partners um, that are solving some of these challenges around fit, like Volumental, who's helping people, you know, get a scan of their foot and know exactly what she was going to fit them, regardless of brand and making sure it's in stock and they have it and creating consumer experience. We're working with folks like First Insight in order to help brands know what product to make at the very start and what prices that they could actually list it at to sell more shoes before you start discounting huge discounts to solve that challenge. And then also we've been working with Klarna who, who focuses on helping spread payments out um, over several months. And I think that is one of the biggest things is figuring out how we reduce friction for people um, in this economy, people who lack more disposable, who lack disposable income, um, who are having employment challenges and issues, but still want to buy pairs of shoes and still need to buy pairs of shoes. How do we make sure that we get them the right pair at the right price? And how do we make sure we can spread those payments out so that they can, they can have less hit up front and, and more spread out. And I think, there's a lot of companies doing a lot of good work, but those are those are three key ones that we've been working with. And, and just kind of tee that up on October 29th, we'll be having a retail roundtable where we invite those three companies um, and a footwear executive to talk about what's going to happen over the holiday season. We're going to dig in. Um, we're doing it before Halloween because I actually think Halloween's going to kick off the holiday season, weirdly enough. Um, I think retailers are going to be promoting things more, far more advanced than ever before. Um, Typically, some like Amazon start like the first week of November, uh, starting to promote stuff. But I think it'll be way early this year to try to do catch up. But we're going to try to bring some insights to help people prepare um, through November and December to try to try to get back up and get get back in the saddle. Um, Gary, really appreciate all your data and all your insights. And as always, if you're an FDA member, you can go to FDA.org on the Intel Center, all these data and re- all the data and reports that we have that Gary produces for us are there. They're live. They're up to date. Uh, he works every single day on crunching numbers. Um, we do special projects for companies that need it. You know, a um, lot of work there, but the data is telling us where things are headed and where they're going to go. And it's a good good place to compare yourself and your company to the industry averages. So, so Gary, did we miss anything of note 
you know, we're talking about shoe economy that you think we, we need to highlight or do we touch all the key points? Yeah, we really hit on a number of key points. Uh, one issue maybe we haven't uh, uh, mentioned today is uh, what's going on with the dollar. Uh, typically, oh, yeah. as as goes the dollar, you tend to see commodity prices go in the other direction. And we've seen the dollar has uh, has weakened at a pretty good clip over the last uh, two or three months. And that's uh, <clears throat> given some support to a range of uh, uh, costs for commodities used in, in footwear manufacturing. That is something that uh, uh, we also uh, produce a report uh, every month on the FDRE's uh, website that um, uh, Andy had mentioned a moment ago. Uh, and certainly that's something we're uh, uh, you know going to be keeping a close eye on going forward if the dollar continues to erode. All right, great. So folks, uh, that's a well-rounded look at the shoe economy, the, the current marketplace trends, uh, it's a look at our broader economic picture and what we're dealing with right now. Again, we're we're kind of at a plateau right now. We hope we see bumps up. We hope we don't see bumps down. There's a lot of unknowns, you know, whether whether certain sectors of the economy close again across the country, but um, could impact things and numbers and things looking forward. I think, though, psychologically, a lot of us have adapted to our environments, and we know that if things have to close down, this curbside delivery and pickup and things like that worked really well. And I think people will be more equipped than ever before so that we won't see full shutdowns. Like we saw, there'll be smart shutdowns. Um, so I, I think that that's something to caveat that, but overall um, we're constantly looking at the numbers. So if people out there have questions uh, about what's happening, let us know. We're happy to help out, but people really need to have a, a reality check about what the economy is and about where our marketplace is for footwear to better prepare for 2021 and, and beyond. This is probably likely a three to five year recovery back to the 2019 levels that we saw, unfortunately. Um, and so, you know, better better to swallow it and, and get on with it than to, to stick your head in the sand and not imagine that things are gonna get back to normal. Um, so Gary, uh, again, thank you very much for coming on today and sharing all these insights and, and, ru- and running all those numbers every single week for us. Um, So with that, uh, again, if you have ideas for shows, if you have guests you think we should interview, drop us a line at shoeandshow.com. Please rate our podcast. Uh, We're on every single podcast platform known to man, iTunes, Spotify, (laughs) etc. We are everywhere uh, invading the the radio waves. So please, uh, please rate us. Please tell your friends. Please pass us along to colleagues to let them listen into what's really happening in the marketplace. Um, And with that, thank you guys very much. Stay safe as always, my friends. And until next time, Shoe In is out. Shoe In has been brought to you by the FDRA, the footwear industry's association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion, helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. For information about FDRA, visit FDRA.org.